a world separate from our own, yet somehow controlling it. The backyard. Hidden behind its gates are the eternal truths of good and of evil, of creation and destruction, of chaos the likes of which mankind has never seen. In a time long past, a philosopher entered this other realm. He returned and through shuddering breaths he spoke. No evil should touch this place. This philosopher sealed all that the backyard was into a single tome. His hope was that mankind would never stumble upon its power. With that, the path to the backyard was forever barred and peace once again blessed our world. But what followed, the ancient sage could never have predicted. For evil came not from a human who discovered the book, but from inside the backyard itself. Heaven or hell, get ready to rock. The memories of Aska R. Cruz. Isotope and Isolation. In a time long gone, before the end of friendships and a century of war, Frederick Balsara, Aria Hale, and Aska R. Cruz had a philosophical discussion about the nature of creation, evolution, and the guiding influence of something in between. Aria, at the start of her workday, notes that the other two had not slept and that she was entering a discussion in its fifth hour. As a thought exercise, Aska asks Aria if she believes all products of the natural world are accidents of low probability. Aria concurs that this is stochastically correct. Aska hypothesizes that though we have never identified and measured the existence of a creator, something theoretical could exist that defines the outcomes of all natural events in minute detail. Aria thinks it would be reasonable enough to call this theoretical thing God. Aska then points out that within a given evolutionary model, there sometimes exists a missing link, where species A becomes species C, but evidence of step B is missing. This might be caused by a number of factors as identified by the theoretical God, but he finds the idea of a third-party interference in the process to be a compelling consideration, as it is entirely possible that an outside factor could force species A to become C by rewriting DNA. Aska dubs this factor Apocalypse. Arya considers the theory, but deems it too wildly impractical. Aska notes that throughout history, considerable numbers of species with missing links have gone extinct, and that the intervention of Apocalypse could lead to ruin. Frederick interjects that Aska's statements are in fact absurd, and Arya shouldn't believe him. You should be the one that chooses your own path. No one else's hand should decide for you. It's that simple. Good, says Aska. I feel the same way. Aska awakens in a dark room, inside a coffin-like device overflowing with colorless liquid with hundreds of superfine metal threads connected to his hippocampus. Raven, who is standing nearby, presses a switch, removing the lid from the device. Aska sits up. His body's been rejuvenated once again, and he feels restored. However, the permanent memory loss associated with this process continues to be a complication of extending his life. Thus, Aska is in the process of backing up his memories, and notes to Raven that this one in particular has elicited some nostalgia. Baptisma 13 Epilogue Aska and Raven stand in the backyard after the destruction of Valentine. Aska feels that things will not go as smoothly next time, as there's no telling when the next Valentine will appear, or if there will be tens of thousands of them. He wonders if the flame of corruption will be the one to end things. Raven remarks that the dragon install has started to encroach, and vows his protection. But Aska says that won't be needed. History will write its own course, and it'll be Raven's responsibility to witness it. The time of apocalypse approaches, and Arya won't wait any longer. Twilight 
2187 AD. In the aftermath of Baptisma 13, the UN holds an emergency session. Kai Kisk, first king of Illyria, proposes human coexistence with Gears. The proposal is defeated and never mentioned to the public, but as a result, many heads of state begin to distrust Kai. World powers begin to develop their own countermeasures to provide humanity with defense against the unknown. The Conclave initiates the Cyprus Project, a weapons development program for magic-based firearms usable by those without magical aptitude. Furthermore, magical constructs called Opus Units are developed. Effective in traditional combat as well as magic support, they're designed to obey without question. Production output for both the Cyprus and Opus projects takes place in a secret research lab named Frasco 2, overseen by Leon Mining, a nefarious founder of the Post-War Administration Bureau, with political ties to the Assassin's Guild. Starting with Illyria, shipments of Opus units are soon deployed to every major city globally, as per the orders of the Sanctus Maximus Populi. The Sanctus Populi organization is not technically a religion, as they have no doctrine and require no faith, but they're nonetheless treated with the same devotion and trust by the general population. While vast amounts of knowledge have been lost to time, after the dawn of revival, humanity never forgot those who they relied on amidst the chaos. It was only natural that the apostles that saved humanity would soon be surrounded by devout followers. These followers became the founding body of the Sanctus Populi organization. Currently, though the Conclave holds decision-making power over world governments, the Sanctus Populi's leadership position, Sanctus Maximus, holds the true final executive decision. For eight years from 2169 to 2177, the position of Sanctus Maximus was held by Happiness the 27th, a beloved, gentle, and fair man, but in his final days, he deteriorated both mentally and physically, eventually dying of fatigue. He is succeeded by his appointed cardinal. Ariels. A woman known for being calm and virtuous. However, the Sanctus Maximus is not the only one preparing countermeasures in the wake of Baptisma 13. Guilty Gear. Fast Edge XT. Nearly a century ago, in anticipation of justice, Soul created the Outrage. Now, with the emergence of Valentine from the backyard, and Asuka insinuating that there are more to come, Soul seeks the Outrage components, also known as the Sacred Treasures, to upgrade his Fire Seal Sword into something capable of handling whatever else comes from the backyard. Dr. Paradigm introduces Soul to a gunsmith dog capable of helping construct weapons according to Soul's designs. In homage to Junkyard, the unrefined slab he used during his Holy Order days, Soul has the fire seal encased in another magic amplifier and christens it the Junkyard Dog Mark II. Soul and Sin receive intel from Dr. Paradigm detailing that the Conclave is made up of four sages. Axis, the first. Libraria, the second. Baldius, the third. And their leader, Cronus, the fourth. They currently possess the Flashing Fang, an outrage component that amplifies light magic. May has additional intel, saying that they actually have more than one outrage component, and that they might be kept in a secret North European location called Hardened Fort. Conclave appears to have also put a bounty out on Sol's head, 
resulting in a number of bounty hunters gunning for him, from unknown soldiers to a few familiar faces, such as Bridget. Sol also crosses paths with Milia Rage, who's seeking truth surrounding rumors that Zato's body has been stolen. Through Cronus, we learn that the Conclave have appointed themselves the only true leaders of humanity, and they're awaiting something called St. Elmo's Fire to become gods. They possess three outrage parts, the Flashing Fang, the Dominator, and Baikal. They believe King Kai knows too much and will need to be put down, but it's too early to do so. Sol, however, can't be allowed to be an obstacle to them any longer. Sol and Sin infiltrate Hardened Fort and encounter Baldius, who taunts them and attacks using forbidden magic, allowing him to fight with a power closely resembling Eddie, named Cerberus. It is unknown whether or not this is made possible due to the Conclave research into Zato One's corpse. Despite Baldius's taunting, he reveals nothing of the Conclave's intentions. Though he's able to absorb Sol's Fafnir attack, he's ultimately outmatched and melts away into a puddle to escape. His injuries prove to be fatal, however, and he dies shortly after, bolstering the resolve of the remaining sages. A teacup is placed upside down in his memory at future Conclave meetings. Sol retrieves the Flashing Fang and integrates it into his sword, finalizing it as Junkyard Dog Mark III. When activated, the outer casing opens up to reveal an integrated fire seal alongside parts that resemble Bridget's revolving yo-yo. The combined usage of two Outrage components allows its original purpose to be fulfilled. A portable weapon capable of firing the all-powerful spell, Saint Oratorio. Guilty Gear Exert Sign. これより全世界に宣戦布告する。あなた方出来損ないの人形どもは全て根絶やしにする。未来を悲観しろ。October 21st, 2187 AD, a being called Ramlethal Valentine announces her existence to the world publicly, broadcasting a declaration of war on humanity. October 23rd, the Conclave meets in a location known as the Tea Room to discuss their secret negotiations with Ramlethal and their intentions to rewrite the history of mankind. They assess all particular persons of interest who might interfere with their plans. Eno reflects that though she's gone through the integration point and killed Ramlethal many times in many timelines, it does not change the outcome of a dull, gray world. Babylon, five years in the future, with humanity nowhere in sight. However, bringing that man into this time cycle has finally caused some change as she realizes that Sol has become much stronger than usual 
that she's unable to kill Ravnifal. She's ecstatic at the prospect of no longer being obsessed with this world's outcome. Suddenly, a time slip trap that she set goes off, bringing Axel Lowe to 2192 AD. Axel Lowe time slips to 2192 AD, to the city of Babylon, five years in the future. A voice reaches out to Axel, and the man calling himself the original asks him to deliver a message to that man. Axel then time slips directly into a dream world in which he is almost killed by an immensely powerful enigma called Bedman. But he's pulled out at the last second by a time slip trap set by Ina. Shocked that Axel knows about the existence of the original, she agrees to let him deliver his message, ignoring his request to instead be sent back to his home in Cotswolds, England, 1998. Potemkin is assigned to investigate Ramlethal on behalf of Zep. However, due to Bedman's interference, he spends three days trapped inside the nightmare theater of Bedman's slumber, delaying Zep from acting without intel until it's too late. Bedman reveals himself to be a clandestine operator and an agent serving an unknown client. Possessing an acute intellect and expansive vocabulary, he excels at identifying weaknesses and exposing them. He appears to always be silent and asleep, carried by his magically weaponized bed frame. His silence is only apparent to those in the waking world, however. In the nightmare theater of his permanent slumber, he is a braggadocious, condescending, and long-winded individual. どれ<笑> <笑>いや、すまない。正直僕も緊張してたね。何せ僕が本気で戦っても君は壊れないというのだから。でも壊れないはそういった限度という規律で成り立つ相互互換的な価値の一切を拒絶している。文化文明感情研鑽過去と未
he exits the prison, where he's reunited with her, Venom, and later on, Slayer. While Zato no longer has his former personality or complete memories, his desire to protect Milia remains strong. Faust receives an invitation to Slayer's manor, Villa Vampire. Slayer tips him off that the death of his young patient was staged malpractice orchestrated by the Conclave and executed by Zato I, who somehow lives. Faust then confronts the recently freed Zato at the Opera House. Zato's behavior is surprisingly earnest. He tells Faust to kill him if he wishes, as he has every right to, but he asks for a bit of time first. He then explains that Faust's research led him to the ultimate procedure, resurrection. Not only was this discovery integral to the Conclave's ultimate goals, they also couldn't allow its existence to be known by anyone. Thus, a conspiracy was hatched against Dr. Baldhead, and that soon they intend to use this power. King Kai Kisk of Illyria gathers intel on Ramlethal and puts a plan into action. He's suspicious of the timing of her appearance alongside the recently activated Opus units as well, and concludes that the government can no longer be trusted. Kai prepares 300,000 world dollars and contacts Soul Bad Guy to hire his services. Soul demands one million. <laughs> Together, alongside Sin Kisk, they journey to the ruins of Japan to confront Ramlethal. October 28th, 2187 AD. Ramlethal is defeated in the ruins of Japan, but Seoul catches on to the fact that they've been baited. Who declares war on the world and then sits waiting in the middle of nowhere? Ramlethal concedes that the outcome of this battle was irrelevant, as she was only a distraction. Suddenly, a tremendous floating fortress known as the Cradle appears above the city of Babylon for a brief moment, then disappears, emitting a massive information shockwave. All living beings in the city are atomized in the process.
a monumental black sigil appears in the sky, identical to the one seen above the ruins of Japan, and the one seen when Dragon Install's soul activates the true power of the Fire Seal. Contact has been made with the backyard. Kai, Soul, and Sin observe in horror as countless innocents are killed. Kai exclaims that everything is happening just like she said. Could she have been telling the truth? Soul asks him what the hell he knows, but before they can react, Ramlethal grabs Soul and flies upwards, beginning a self-destruct sequence. I think it's time we died. Let's go together.